Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Friday, July 24th. Uh, we're trying out a new camera tonight. It seems to be higher resolution. Uh, so unfortunately you get to see me in sharper detail. But at least I'm actually looking at you when I'm looking at what I'm reading too. So that's a good thing. So let's see what happens. Let's begin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus Christ, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Our New Testament reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 21. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nansen of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses, so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed... We have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. When seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd, for the mob of the people followed, crying out, Away with him. And we'll hear more about that. That actually is the readings for 
uh, Saturday and probably Sunday too. Yeah, so the continuation of that, maybe we'll change that up so we can talk about it, listen to it, uh, read it on Monday. And we'll switch up the readings because that kind of leaves you hanging. Our Book of Concord reading. We continue reading the Augsburg Confession. These are the last of the short articles. And then tomorrow we'll start getting into the longer ones and only do an article a day. So we begin with Article 14. Order in the Church. Our churches teach that no one should publicly teach in the church or administer the sacraments without a rightly ordered call. Short article. Article 15. Church Ceremonies. Our churches teach that ceremonies ought to be observed that may be observed without sin. Also, ceremonies and other practices that are profitable for tranquility and good order in the church, in particular holy days, festivals, and the like, ought to be observed. And uh, holy days and festivals, that would be days like the saint days, like uh, St. Mary Magdalene, St. James is tomorrow, uh, and days like that. Yet the people are taught that consciences are not to be burdened as though observing such things was necessary for salvation. Colossians 2, 16-17. <clears throat> they are also taught that human traditions instituted to make atonement with God, to merit grace, and to make satisfaction for sins are opposed to the gospel and the doctrine of faith. So vows and traditions concerning meats and days and so forth, instituted to merit grace, and to make satisfaction for sins, are useless and contrary to the gospel. That would be things like uh, eating no meat on Fridays, and that kind of thing. Article 16. Civil Government. Our churches teach that lawful civil regulations are good works of God. They teach that it is right for Christians to hold political office, to serve as judges, to judge matters by imperial laws and other existing laws, to impose just punishments, to engage in just wars, to serve as soldiers, to make legal contracts, to hold property, to take oaths when required by the magistrates, for a man to marry a wife or a woman to be given in marriage. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists who forbid these political offices to Christians. We would see that today among the Amish uh, who don't serve in the military and things like that. They also condemn those who do not locate evangelical perfection in the fear of God and in faith, but place it in forsaking political offices. For the gospel teaches an eternal righteousness of the heart, Romans 10.10. At the same time, it does not require the destruction of the civil state or the family. The gospel very much requires that they be preserved as God's ordinances and that love be practiced in such ordinances. Therefore, it is necessary for Christians to be obedient to their rulers and laws. The only exception is when they are commanded to sin. Then they ought to obey God rather than men. Acts 5.29 Article 17. Christ's Return for Judgment Our churches teach that at the end of the world, Christ will appear for judgment and will raise all the dead. 1 Thessalonians 4.13-5.2 he will give the godly and elect eternal life and everlasting joys, but he will condemn ungodly people and the devils to be tormented without end. Matthew 25, 31-46 Our churches condemn the Anabaptists, who think that there will be an end to the punishments of condemned men and devils. Our churches also condemn those who are spreading certain Jewish opinions, that before the resurrection of the dead, the godly shall take possession of the kingdom of the world, the ungodly being everywhere suppressed. And unfortunately, some of our American evangelicals are doing just that, where they hold the opinion that the kingdom of Israel must be preserved uh, and that we should do everything we can to make sure the state of Israel is still there because only when the temple is rebuilt in a Jewish homeland, only then can Christ return. That is an incorrect interpretation of certain passages in Revelation. Article 18, Free Will. Our churches teach that a person's will has some freedom to choose civil righteousness and to do things subject to reason. It has no power without the Holy Spirit to work the righteousness of God, that is, spiritual righteousness. 
For the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 This righteousness is worked in the heart when the Holy Spirit is received through the Word. Galatians 3.2-6 This is what Augustine says in his Hyponoxticon, Book 3. We grant that all people have a free will. It is as free as far as it is the judgment of reason. This does not mean that it is able without God either to begin or at least to complete anything that has to do with God. It is free only in works of this life, whether good or evil. Good I call those works that spring from the good in nature, such as willing late to labor in the field, to eat and drink, to have a friend, to clothe oneself, to build a house, to marry a wife, to raise cattle, to learn various useful arts, or whatsoever good applies to this life. For all of these things depend on the providence of God. They are from him and exist through him. Works that are willing to worship an idol, to commit murder, and so forth, I call evil. Our churches condemn the Pelagians and others who teach that without the Holy Spirit by natural power alone, we are able to love God above all things and do God's commandments according to the letter. Although nature is able in a certain way to do the outward work, for it is able to keep the hands from theft and murder, yet it cannot produce the inward motions, such as the fear of God, trust in God, chastity, patience, and so on. Article 19. The Cause of Sin Our teaches, churches teach that although God creates and preserves nature, the cause of sin is located in the will of the wicked, that is, the devil and ungodly people. Without God's help, this will turns itself away from God, as Christ says, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character. John 8, 44. And that is all for this evening. Uh, on Monday, we will look at Article 20, uh, Good Works. And just to let you know, there are, counting the conclusion, we have 28 articles. Uh, plus the conclusion. Uh, each of the remaining articles are a little longer, but not too long. Uh, a couple will be able to do a couple in an evening. But then when we do the apology, some of these really short articles will get bigger and we'll talk about them in more detail. So if a couple things sounded really quick and a little confusing when we get to the apology, uh, that'll all be expanded at great length. Philip Melanchthon was nothing if not a good writer and a long-winded one at t when it's necessary. So we now join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, we thank you, that you have redeemed us poor and condemned creatures, not by any of our works, merit, or worthiness, but by your holy suffering, death, and shedding of blood. O Lord, your suffering was great, your torment was heavy. We cannot comprehend how many your stripes, how deep your wounds, or the bitterness and painfulness of your death. How inexpressible is your love that reconciled us to your heavenly Father. In great fear of death, you sweat blood on the Mount of Olives, drops of blood that fell upon the earth, and there, abandoned by all your disciples, you willingly gave yourself into the hands of those who led you mercilessly, bound hard and cruel, from one unjust judge to another. You were falsely accused and condemned, spit upon, scoffed at, and struck in the face with fists. For the sake of our misdeeds, you were hit, whipped, crowned with thorns, and treated wretchedly, like a worm and not a man. You were despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
so that even a heathen heart took pity and said, Behold the man. For the sake of our sin you were counted a sinner, and hung up between two evildoers as a curse. You were pierced in hands and feet with nails, and in your highest thirst you were given vinegar and gall to drink. Finally, in great pain, you gave up your spirit, so that you could pay our debt and we could be healed by your wounds. O Lord Jesus Christ, for this and all your other suffering and pain we give you thanks and praise. We pray you, let your holy bitter suffering and death not be lost on us, but grant that at all times this may be our comfort, and that we may boast in it, and that as we ponder it, all evil desire in us may be snuffed out and subdued, and all virtue may be implanted and increased, so that we, having died to sin, may live in righteousness, following the example you have left us, walking in your footsteps, enduring evil with patience, and suffering injustice with a good conscience. Amen. Lord Jesus, your, by your death, the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom, giving access to your holy presence to all people. By the preaching of your gospel, may you be our peace, for you have made us one and have broken down in your flesh the dividing wall of hostility by fulfilling the law in your death on the cross. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.